I'm going to die of this disease unless there's a, a miracle cure. And if I let myself think about that already, I'm going to be a terrible person. I'm going to be anxious, I'm going to be depressed, I'm going to be stuck inside, I'm going to be nothing. But I, I choose to make a difference in the world. Josh, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, man, it's a pleasure. I've been looking forward to it for quite a while. So I'm, I'm glad to be here, man. Yeah, happy to have you here. For listeners that might not be familiar with you, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, well, my name is Joshua Busby. Some of you guys on the X streets know me and know me pretty well. Uh, some people call me the Cookie Monster because sometimes I have a rascally voice from breathing with this breathing machine. And this breathing machine is what they call non-invasive mechanical ventilation, and it helps me breathe. So without this, I would not be in this great interview with Artie today. So. I like to get that out of the way, so sometimes it may be hard to understand me, but just remember, you're a good pal, Cookie Monster. But uh, I was born with the shin muscular dystrophy, and it's a progressive disease. We're going to talk a little bit more about that, that slowly through time causes my muscles to deteriorate, and ultimately, it is a fatal disease. Uh, There is no cure. And uh, the last thing it usually affects is your heart, your heart and your lungs. So um, I'm 42 and I'm married to a wonderful lady who's been my wife for 20 years. And I have an 18 year old son who is perfectly healthy and getting ready to go to Baylor University to become a doctor. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, I've been a minister before. And now I am a life coach. So that's a little bit about what I do right now. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, To get started, how old were you when you got diagnosed with Duchenne? Well, my brother also uh, had Duchenne and uh, he was older than me and he got diagnosed first. And at that time, they were doing a thing called a muscle biopsy. So they'd have to put you to sleep, take a piece of your muscle out and kind of examine it do a microscope and kind of test it and see, you know, if, if they see the disease in, in you. And uh, that was back in the early 80s. So technology has progressed a lot since then. But we kind of knew that if he had it, then most likely the other sibling would as well. And uh, so I was about maybe five when I had my biopsy done. And it confirmed that, yeah, I indeed had uh, Duchenne as well as my brother, which was devastating for my family. They didn't know anything about it. And, you know, I see new parents that get the diagnosis and it's devastating. And I'm in a lot of groups on uh, meta of families that are just now getting the news of the diagnosis. And it's pretty rough on the family. And it kind of gives me an insight to how my family may have felt, you know. Uh, had, did, have you talked to your parents about it? Um, are your parents both living and have you talked to them about? No, my my uh, my mom died when I was 22-ish, about to get married. Hmm. And my dad died when I was 12 years old. So both of them had heart attacks and you know, that's that's what took them. Um, my mom and dad got a divorce early on, so it was just my mom taking care of me a lot. And my dad moved away to Texas. Uh, strangely, I now live in Texas, but at the time I lived in Alabama. Mm. And my mom and dad got a divorce, so my mom had to take care of me a lot. And she was taking care of two guys with my disease. And, you know, I had my uncles that would step in and my my grandfather would step in to help. But no, not really got a chance to ask her, you know, how they felt about the diagnosis. Um, Now, about my dad, he was not a bad guy. I don't want to present that idea. He was a good guy. He's never violent towards me, um, never treated me badly, just 
maybe he didn't want to be around it. Maybe I, I, I don't really know his motivation hmm. uh, for leaving, but he would come back with gifts on Christmas and, you know, trying to be a good dad, but uh, I guess he couldn't, maybe he couldn't be there already like every day seeing his, his boy struggle. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, was your did your dad have Duchenne or was your mom? No, 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 no. The, the the way it works is the female passes down uh, the disease. She's the carrier. The female's the carrier of the disease, and it manifests itself in the males. Typically, now there are a few females that get it for some unknown genetic reason. I don't know a lot about genetics yeah. but the people i talked to told me that when i had a son he would not be affected because my wife is not a carrier of the disease so they okay. said what might happen is your son could possibly have a daughter who would be a carrier and then her children that are males could possibly get the disease so it's basically passed down through the female so it didn't come from didn't come from my dad, so he was perfectly healthy. Mm. It, it's a little surprising that your son could be a carrier, because what I understood from what I read is it's on the X chromosome. So if you have if you have a son, you're going to pass on your Y chromosome to your son. Your your wife is going to pass on an X chromosome. If you have a daughter, right. you would you would both p- pass on an X chromosome. So you could you could p- pass it on to your daughter to make her a carrier. Potentially, if you had a daughter, right? That's I what think. I've been told. Yeah, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't think that your son could pass it on to. Oh okay, yeah, yeah. You, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. If I had a daughter, okay, okay, she would that be the carrier. Sense. You're you're right. Not my son's daughter. Excuse me. Yeah, I got that wrong. That's why I need my wife over here. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, thank you. I really appreciate you bringing that out because that that can be misunderstanding for a lot of people, and yeah, a lot yeah. of people they encourage you don't have children because they don't know how it works, and it, it, you, there's no way a guy with sin can pass on the disease to his his uh, children. So yeah, but like okay. you said, he could have a daughter, and then the daughter could yeah. So if if uh. If your wife were a carrier and right. you have it, and then you had a, a son, then they could Ooh. have it. Or yeah, if you had a right. daughter, if you had a daughter, then uh, it's possible. So like if you have a daughter, it they're usually a carrier, but women can get the disease. It's just a lot more rare and they yeah. usually have more mild symptoms. It's more mild if they do, if they're a carrier, if I, is what my understanding was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there, there are, are women, and it, it, it's something new that they didn't focus on. It was always the boys, the boys, the boys, you know. Yeah. Back in the, what, the day, Jerry Lewis did his annual mm-hmm. Labor Day telephone, and the emphasis was always on the boys with the shin and, and the children with the shin. And now here I am, 42 years old, and, you know, things have changed since those days. So, Yeah. So it it creates a it's a mutation in the DMD uh, gene, which right. uh, encodes the protein dystrophin, and uh, dystrophin is, is essential for maintaining the structural integrity of muscle cells. So basically, the integrity of your muscle cells is is constantly in jeopardy, and and you yes. Over time, you lose control of your muscles. Um, it's yeah. There's no treatment, or there's no cure. There's no cure. No there's cure. treatment. There's treatment like steroids. So I, I'd imagine you've taken steroids throughout your life. No, to- I, I, I unfortunately I was never in on any of the uh, new treatments. So I'm just okay. uh, I'm an outlier from the '80s. So. But even with those treatments, all mm-hmm. you're doing is slowing it down. You're not stopping it. There's no stopping it. It's going That's to correct. take its toll. 
and, and, and with the new treatments come side effects like osteoporosis, their bones are weaker. Um, you know, steroids can make you uh, gain a lot of weight. So it's really, if there are any parents that, that come across this podcast, really, I encourage you to to think very, very, very long and hard about the decision on every treatment, you know, because you, you don't want to cause another problem by trying to save your children, you know. Yeah. You don't want to injure their quality of life by trying to save their life. That, that's a very, it's a tough balance already that these parents have to find themselves in. And I try to put myself in their shoes and say, how would I feel if my son had this disease? Would I risk his quality of life in order to prolong his life? It's It's a tough decision these guys have to make, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very tough decision. Um, what were the steps your mother took once you get diagnosed with it? Like what was the progression like? So you get diagnosed at five years old. Um, mm-hmm. you had a suspicion that you are probably positive for it, but you, you didn't really have any sy- symptoms too much yet at that point. Uh, you start to walk on your tippy toes. Like that is mm-hmm. one of the main signs you start to walk on the tip of your toes and and then there's a certain type of walk that you start to exhibit and uh your calf muscles get really big so that is a a big red flag that you possibly had to send muscular dystrophy uh the calves are, are a little are big excuse me um struggling getting upstairs and when you fall down there's like a certain way that someone with the shins would get up off the floor and it kind of looks like a crab getting up so there there are some uh things physically that you can observe and see that yeah this is the shin muscular dystrophy here uh in this in this patient so it's uh you start falling down yeah and for me i started falling down at school and that became a liability and the school kind of forced me into a wheelchair um, because of, you know, it was just liability issues for me to be walking down the hallway. And suddenly my legs get out and I fall on the ground. So yeah. they basically told my family he needs a wheelchair. So, and the first step is a manual wheelchair that you have to push with your arms. And then the, you later can get a power chair, which I have now. And the power chair really opens up freedom for guys with the shin. It, it just opens up the world to them. Yeah. And some guys, you know, I'm I'm a life coach and I'm coaching a lot of guys with my disease. And some of them have a hard time transitioning to the wheelchair because they feel like they're giving up to the disease. You know, they're, they're giving in, they're losing but for me, the wheelchair gave me more freedom. And for me, it wasn't like I'm resigning to giving up. It's like I'm resigning to the thing in my life I can't change. And this is what I tell my clients, you know, focus on the things you can change. You can't change your disease, but you can get in this power chair, which is going to open many doors for you to go outdoors and go shopping and not fall down and, you know, go out and have a good quality of life. So power wheelchair came and then um, with with muscular dystrophy, you have scoliosis as well. And that's the curvature of the spine. And since your muscles are not there in your back to support the spine, it starts to curve. And in my case, I needed surgery to put two rods in my back. So I was about 15 years old already, and they put these two rods in my back. Mm -hmm. And they fused them to the spine. So I got two rods infused to my spine right now. All I need is the neural link and uh, some AI technology. And I'm going to be part AI and part human. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> nah, nah, nah. 
Would you do? Would you do do Neuralink? Um, I want to see a little more. I want to see a little more information um, because I know that the the links that they attach to your brain are like as thin as a horse hair. Hmm. And I know one of the first patients didn't the the link come out a little bit, and he started uh, exhibiting some some symptoms from that. Hmm. So I, I'd be kind of concerned about it, but I'm impressed by what I see. And yeah. but fixing the brain to make my body move is not going to fix the problem because the problem's with your muscles. And yeah. if you're overworking your body, it's going to put a stress on your heart. So if I use a neural link and it helps me to move my body, it's going to strain other parts of my my muscular system. And so it wouldn't be a good thing. It's really tough, man. It's a tough balance. Yeah, it's it's different than being like a paraplegic or anything like that. Like a paraplegic can't communicate with the, those parts of their body, but they have... Right. As, as long as it hasn't been too long and they don't have an atrophy, they would have... The muscle and and the ability, physical ability to move. I would imagine, I'm not an expert on that at all. Um, do you know much about the the calves being your your calves getting bigger? It seems kind of yeah. counterintuitive. I'm not sure why that happens. Um, it could be the maybe breakdown of the muscle fiber in the calf, mm. maybe. That kind of acts like an inflammation type thing, maybe. Hmm. Uh, I'm not too sure, but definitely something to look into if you haven't done so. Yeah. What about the uh, walking on your tippy toes? Do you know why that is? That I have no no idea why that would be a a thing. Um, maybe I don't know. The, maybe hmm. the weight of the full force of your body. Yeah, maybe like the actual flexing. Yeah, maybe maybe so. The full movement is difficult or something like that, so it's easier to just to stand your tippy toes, maybe? Right. Yeah. Yeah, later on in the early years, you do need a surgery on the back of your heel. And what they do is they cut the back of your heel and they like, because um, it gets tight and they like loosen the the heel cord. And uh, they did that surgery on me. And it's supposed to help you walk with your foot flat on the ground. And, you know, around the time that I was falling down at school, they did that surgery on me. Yeah. And after the surgery, I never walked ever again. And it wasn't the surgery. It was my fear already. I allowed fear to allow me to stay in the safe place, which was the wheelchair. Because after the surgery, they wanted me to get up and walk around. And I I was scared I was going to fall. I was scared it was going to hurt. So mm-hmm. I didn't follow through with the physical therapy needed. So that kind of contributed to me going into the wheelchair a little earlier than, yeah. than I really needed to. And that in the school saying, hey, you're falling down too much. You need to get in the wheelchair. So, when when they kind of forced you to get into the wheelchair, did that did that make the disease progress a little bit faster? Because one of the, I mean, physical therapy and staying active for as long as you can seems to right. be a benefit for you know holding off the disease and the progression a little bit. So, did pushing you to go in the wheelchair? mean you your disease progressed a little bit faster at that point? Uh, I'm not sure if I would I would classify it that way. Um because I knew it was time to I could feel it. Mm-hmm. You know, with with the shin you kind of feel when your body is adding up of a certain thing. And my body was getting tired and it was ready to to sit down and yeah. And rest, but yeah, you do atrophy and uh, your legs do kind of get stuck. I can't straighten my legs all the way out now. My feet, mm-hmm. I can't straighten all the way out. 
And now when I got married, my wife worked with me and stretched my legs and, and kind of, she still does that today. Like we're in bed, you know, rested. So like stretch my legs out yeah. and try to help me get some of that range of motion uh, into my legs. So the, the miracle that really God brought in my life is my wife. And she has been the best wife God could have ever sent me. And now, look, we, we fight and fuss too, guys. I mean, we're, we're human beings. And I know you know how this is uh, in relationships. Already, you're, you're yeah. two different people. And you have your own way of doing things. And then my wife is not just my wife. She's my caretaker. Yeah. So she gives me my bath in the morning. She's getting me dressed, getting me up, you know, making me look good. And when I look bad, that's not her fault. That's just, she don't have much to work with already. So she, <laughs> she has to try to make it look good somehow. So we fight a little bit about that kind of stuff, you know. Maybe I don't like the way she's doing something, but she has to do it yeah. uh, in order to take care of me. So that we, we fight about stuff like that. But we're connected to each other. We love each other. And we know we know at the end of the day, we love each other and where we stand. And I think I contribute my longevity with this disease, partly to her and partly to my son and most definitely to my faith that that's really been a big, a big positive and uh, purpose to get up every day, you know? Yeah. When did you, uh, when did you and your wife meet? We actually met online. It was a voice chat program. It was called Pal Talk. It's kind of like Yahoo chat. Hmm. That was called Pal Talk. It's no longer here. I don't, I don't think. And I'm trying to remember the exact year we met. I'm not too sure. I think it was 2002. Hmm. But we met online and we had it stuck up a good conversation. But at that time in my life, I was in full share my faith mode. Because Christianity is a big part of my life because I believe that it gave me hope, and I believe that other people should have the same hope. So I was online, and I was sharing, you know, the message of Jesus with teenagers. And this girl, her name was Jesus. Uh, no, her name was Care Bear. My name was Jesus Disciple. Her name was Care Bear. And she was looking for a friend. That's all she was looking for. And she messaged me out of the blue because she saw my name and thought, oh, this is going to be a nice Christian guy I can talk to. And I was like, well, how are you doing? How old are you? Are you a Christian? She's like, yeah. And I was like, oh, that's, that's great. No. Have a great day. I'll, I'll talk to you later. And and that was it, because I was looking for people that were needing, you know, inspiration, needing hope. They didn't know uh, our faith. And she did. And so I thought, well, my job's done here. I can go somewhere else. Yeah. But Arnie, this girl would not leave me alone, man. She would <laughs> not stop. So every day and every week, she'd see me and message me. And she told me she was about to give up. She sent me one final message. And she's going to wait to see what I would, I would say. And when the message came through, something clicked inside me. And I said, God, if you want me to marry this woman, I'll talk to her. If that's it. But guys, don't make don't make deals with God. You you don't do that. But you know, so I talked to her and we talked on the phone for all night long that day. And and she made plans to come visit me in Alabama. She lived in Texas. Hmm. So her and her mom got on a bus and they traveled down to Alabama, and that week when she was there, we got engaged. It was uh, when you know already, you kind of know, and God brought all the puzzle pieces together. And I went and introduced her to my grandmother, and my grandmother's like, I'll give you guys a hundred dollars so you can go get a, a ring. 
And if you don't want to get married, uh, then here, go get this ring and get engaged. And yeah, so we did. We got engaged and then she went back home to save up the money to move back to Alabama. And she was staying in the spare room at, at my house. And my mom was a chaperone, so we kept things all good that way. So no appearance of evil going on there. And then that's when my mom passed away, when my wife was staying there. And we had went to watch The Sound of Music in, in, in my room. We were watching The Sound of Music. And I love musicals. My whole life is a musical. That's a different story. So somewhere in the middle of The Sound of Music, I heard my mom yell. And my mom had schizophrenia as well. So it would not be uncommon to hear her yell if she's being bothered by her schizophrenia at the moment. So I thought that's what it was. And at the end of the movie, my wife went to her room to go to bed. And I went to the hallway by my mom's bedroom. I couldn't get into her room. Hmm. So I'd, I'd, I'd normally just call her out, Mom, I'm ready to go to bed. And she'd get up and put me in the bed. And I'll tell you, the most eerie feeling in the world is when you know your mom's supposed to answer, and she normally answers. And she did. Hmm. And the first thought in my mind was, you know, Christina, come, I think she's dead. Come, come wake her up. And my wife went in there and touched her. She didn't wake up. And Christina, you know, let out a screen. I think she's dead. And I was like, what? No, 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 no. Call 911. And we called 911. And my wife is 19 already. She just graduated high school. She didn't. She knew CPR, but knowing CPR and needing to do it to save your husband, your fiance's mother, that's, she couldn't do it. And it, it was very hard for her. Yeah. And one of my uncles, we lived on the same property. All our family lived right there. He came over, it would be my, my mother's brother. And he tried to bring her back, and he got a heartbeat. And when the ambulance got there, she had a heartbeat. And we lived in a double-wide trailer that had a front porch on it. So they loaded her on the, the gurney, and they were taking her down the step. And someone lost grip on the gurney, and it, it dropped a little. Hmm. And when they dropped her on the steps, they lost her heartbeat. Uh, and never got it back. So she unfortunately didn't make it. Yeah, that's uh, that's very tragic. I'm I'm sorry for your loss. Hey, so you were about twenty years old at the time yourself, a little about bit older. 20, 20, 21, 22. Okay. And there was no like she died of a heart attack, but she didn't have anything going on with her heart prior? It was out of nowhere? Uh, yeah, there is a part of that story. When my wife came to visit me and we got engaged, my mom was having what we thought was cold symptoms. This is when she first came to visit with her mother. And then she left and uh, was saving up money to, to move back and then moved in uh, our house. But the first trip she made is when my mom got really sick. And after my wife left for that week, um, she went to the hospital, um, had a blockage of 100% and one at 90%. And they fixed it and they put in a micro valve because hmm. it, it blew her valve out. She had like a heart attack because of the pressure from the 100% blockage and the 90% blockage. So she had a artificial valve in there and like I'd put my head on her chest and I could hear it going tick, tick, tick. It was really cool, but not not in a fascinating way, but like a holy crap way. Yeah. You know, you got this bionic piece inside of your heart keeping you alive. 
And so she did have her eyes at then, and they were able to fix all the stuff there. And then this is about eight months later when my uh, fiance came, and then she had another heart attack, and that was it. So, mm. yeah, with uh, with Duchenne, I mean, your wife and you got married or engaged when you were about 20 years old. You already know that you had Duchenne. Right. I'd imagine that got brought up in earlier conversations. How did that get, how did you broach that topic? I mean, especially when you're going into a dating, like when you're talking right. about marriage and stuff like that, I'd imagine that conversation is like, this isn't going away. I, this is right. the life that I've been dealt and I have to carry this disease my whole life. And, Right. It's going to keep progressing. How did that conversation go? And how did she not get scared away? Honestly, then. Well, I did something that I don't recommend guys do. And uh, I'll explain what I mean. She had pictures of me. But in the pictures, they're like headshots. Mm-hmm. And they did not reveal that I was in a wheelchair. And... I dated a girl long-term in high school, and God, she's probably going to listen to this. I don't care. Um, We were both young and stupid, and uh, she didn't know what she wanted, so she was uh, playing the field while she was still with me. And uh, really, really, it was a long-term relationship for like three years from middle school into high school. And she got a guy that had a truck and I didn't have a truck. So, mm. you know, he was more thrilling than me, but, uh, you know, I had no animosity towards her. We're still friends today. And she actually married another friend of mine. So we're, we're good with that. She's happy. I'm happy, but it kind of broke my heart, uh, early on. And then I dated another girl and we we're pretty serious. And she said that, it scared her is, is why she broke it off with me because it's a lot to ask of uh, a young lady to not just date a guy in a wheelchair, but think about a life in the future with a guy, not only disabled, but terminally ill that could die at any moment. So it's hard. And I protected myself this time and for about three months, I did not tell her I was in a wheelchair. Mm. And I, I know that's not the, the right thing to do, and I would not do it again. But when she found out, she was okay with it. Hmm. She felt a little hurt that I didn't trust her enough to tell her already. But when she found out and understood uh, what it was, she was very accepting and didn't care. She said, I'll love you for as long as God gives, gives you. And in our wedding vows, it says something to that effect that I'll honor and cherish you for as long as God allows. Something to that effect. And so she, she accepted it. And we went through marriage counseling with my then pastor, Larry Gillespie. And Larry Gillespie, my pastor, recently died. So God rest his soul. He was a great man. And uh, after my mom died, my wife actually went to live with his wife and him until things got sorted out and the wedding got planned. And uh, so they were a big part of my life. And he was one of the ones that was there with me when my mom died. And he broke the news to me. She had died. So incredible man that really mentored me into the man I am today. And he gave us marital counseling and he was very honest and open. Like he said, this is a great idea, but he says, I want you to have your eyes wide open. And in our meetings, he explained, you know, you may not see your 50th wedding anniversary. And that needs to be okay with you. You need to understand that this disease is 
it's fatal and your marriage is going to be hard. And if you're ready for that, you know, I support this, this marriage and he, he performed the ceremony. And it was a beautiful ceremony. Like everybody was there, the whole family, the whole, the whole little church was like crammed back full of people that were happy and supportive. And so, how did she respond? I think she responded well. Maybe she didn't know the full picture of what it would do to me in the future. And I had actually lived longer than people thought I would. So. We've had 20 years together, and that's amazing. What is the normal life expectancy after a diagnosis with Duchenne muscular dystrophy? Do you know? Now, when I was growing up, they would tell me it was late teens to early 20s. Mm. So probably about 24, 25, somewhere around there. And nowadays... Some of the guys are living into their 30s, and then 40s are outliers now. And there was one guy recently who died at 60, 61 or 62. Oh, wow. So there, there are outliers that that live outside the um, statistical norm, but uh, it's very rare. But I'm finding more and more guys are living a little bit longer, yeah, yeah, up to my age. So it's it's getting better, but at the time it was not good. With the progression of the disease, is it is it consistent and gradual, or is it like you're stable, like everything's the same for a little bit, and then you kind of have yeah. some things go south, and then you're st- maybe stable again and then go south again? Like, is it, uh, yeah, is it like incremental or more gradual? Right. Well, every case of the shin is different. And I had a neurologist explain it to me this way, that even some people are producing a very limited amount of dystrophy. Mm. So some cases of the shin, they're not producing any dystrophy. None whatsoever. It's just none. And in some cases of, of Duchenne, they're producing a little bit of Duchenne. So their muscle uh, of dystrophy. So their muscles are a bit more stable and they're seeming to be more healthy, more healthy longer. Um, yeah. But yeah, it is a gradual process. My muscles are breaking down even as we're speaking. Um, and what happens in my case is I have a breakdown and muscles are breaking down every day, right? Through just a normal course of the day. And maybe three months later, I'll feel a change. I'm like, oh, because those gradual decreases in muscle tone, because the muscle is basically wasting away, it's going away. Yeah. And you can't bring it back. You can't eat more protein. You can't do, you know, Pilates. Or you can't do, like, you know, weight training with your upper body. Because the more you tear your muscles down, the the more they're not going to come back. Because, yeah. you know, when you lift weights, you're ripping and you're tearing things down and they build back up. But without this thing functioning correctly, you're not going to build back up. So to answer your question, yeah, it it it's a slow, it's a slow fade, and then suddenly you notice it. Hmm. And like there was a time I could feed myself. I used to feed myself with my own fork and and eat that way. And over time, now my wife uh, had to feed me. And now I can't eat anything that's not uh, blended up in a blender. Hmm. So, and that's new. That's new. Yeah, that's just over the last few weeks, right? Yeah, it was gradually happening, but the last, the last maybe month, yeah, I've had to just puree it straight up. And yeah. it's getting harder for me to do stuff on the computer. Um, getting harder to speak, even with the machine. So, 
but like you said, the, these it's gradual, and then suddenly you see it, and you're like, holy crap. Yeah. And this is where coaching has really helped me, Marty, to capture these negative thoughts and reframe them into something positive. And I'm trying to keep a good mindset because if you think about the fact that your muscles are going away and you're going to die, there's no if, ands, or buts about it. I'm going to die of this disease unless there is a a miracle cure. And if I let myself think about that already, I'm going to be a terrible person. I'm going to be anxious. I'm going to be depressed. I'm going to be stuck inside. I'm going to be nothing. But I, I choose to make a difference in the world already. And that's and that's why I coach guys with this gym muscle dystrophy. I want them to have the same mindset that I have. It's yeah. not about what you can't do. It's about what you can do. And I teach them to focus on the things you can do. You can't change the sin, but you can change yourself, your mindset, and what you do with your life. And I know that's a little further than the question you asked, but it, 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 it does build into mindset. So, yeah, slowly it goes away. Suddenly you see the change, and if you don't have the right mindset, it will shatter you. It really hurt. Did you always have that mindset? No, I did not. I did not, no. What was your mindset like before? Uh, And when did it change, uh, too? I was angry. Hmm. Angry, and I would do terrible things to nice people in my neighborhood. And I don't want to go into the details of things I would do because I could probably get in trouble. But it's been a long time ago, but stupid stuff like, you know, taking people's mail out of the mailbox and go throwing it in the woods. Why? Hmm. You know, vandalizing people's cars, like flattening their tires. Why? So I I was just angry, angry, angry kid. And I don't know why I was so angry. I guess the disease made me angry. And, you know, you said what made the difference? What what changed? And um, I know everybody listening to your podcast has different beliefs. And I'm glad for that. I love that you bring... uh, diversity onto your show but for me it was my Christian faith I I found faith in Jesus and when I realized that I was a sinner and really needed help with my sin and from the Christian perspective we believe Jesus died on the cross to take away our sin and that if we place our faith in him and we turn from our sin, our old way, and we turn to Jesus and believe that he rose from the dead three days later. We, we believe that that is when we become born again. We become a new, a new person. And that moment happened to me when I was 19. Mm. And it changed my life. I started being a completely different person. Um, I became more empathetic. I became more loving and kind and wanted to help my fellow man. And it helped me understand that if my earthly body was to perish, I had a heavenly body in heaven waiting. And I, I knew that and that. That helped me get through the bad days of my mom dying and my disease getting worse. And even today, it's the guiding guiding factor in my life. It brings me hope. It brings me clarity of, of what I'm going through, but that there's something better for me. And that the suffering of this life is part of God's plan. And so many are thinking, oh, wait, 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 wait. God wants you to suffer. 
I'm not going to go that far. I'm not going to say God wanted me to suffer. But through my suffering, I think God is getting some glory because even though I'm suffering, I'm having a good attitude. And I'm trying to help people. And, I, and, and I'm saying that it's all because of the blessings of God in my life and my wife and my my friends like you, Artie, and, and the group of people I surround myself with. On X, you know, Fabio and Jason with the Grow With X team. I have some really good people in my life. And I believe God put these people in my life. And I... That is what has helped my mindset. Uh, so faith, scripture reading, prayer. And I was a youth pastor for a while, so I did go to Bible college and graduated in 2012 from Arlington Baptist University and was a youth minister and just shared the same stuff that I needed when I was a teenager, and it was great to do that. But you mentioned the progression of my disease. It it made it harder for me to be a youth pastor. So I stepped down from that, and I did some online stuff like you're doing, podcasting and live streaming, and that was fun. Um, and then I got courses for life coaching and that really also helped me to cultivate a mindset um, because when you're learning how to help other people through the coaching classes you're learning these techniques that you use yourself so that that's how it helps so that's a very long answer but my faith really helped me change my mindset as well as my friends my community I surround myself with hmm. And being a life coach, I kind of life coach myself and, you know, and I have really good people around me that coach me as well. So he's the ground, bro. With your faith, uh, were you, were you Christian before or like, were you Christian, but just not very faithful and then you had a change there or did you actually become Christian around 19? Well, my family, uh, we grew up in uh, Mobile, Alabama. That's down by the, the Florida Panhandle, but uh, really close to the water. Uh, we were outside of the city in the county. And uh, we grew up Baptist. My family uh, went to the Baptist churches. And I didn't go there often to uh, to the church Uh my grandfather was missionary Baptist, and sometimes we'd go to his church. And we had the idea that if you go forward and you shake the preacher's hand, that's all you had to do. You know, and that's what I thought in my little kid's mind. So at 16, I drove my wheelchair down the aisle after one of the services. I shook the pastor's hand, and they scheduled me to be baptized. Hmm. And I was baptized in my bathtub at home. All the deacons came in there. It was a little bathroom. We're all crammed in there, and they baptized me in the bathtub. But they didn't tell me the gospel. And the gospel is that you're a sinner. Jesus died for you. He was buried and rose again. You need to put your faith in him. Repent of your sin and trust him. And that wasn't what I was told. So I was baptized, but I was still living like the devil, is how I describe it. Hmm. I was still engaging in premarital sex, still uh, drinking and doing marijuana and all the stupid stuff I was doing. There was no change in my life already. I was the same guy. Same anger was there. Nothing happened. Hmm. And then at 19, I realized that I started going to a, a church right up the street that Pastor Larry Gillespie was the pastor of. And I had graduated high school, and I had no plan for my future. I was sitting down on my front porch, 
just sitting there. And someone had given me a flyer to this church a while back. So I knew there was a church up there. I knew the signs they met. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to go out there. It was a Wednesday night. And I'm sitting on the front porch in a raggedy T-shirt, right? It's summertime. Um, I got shorts on. So I drive up to this church and just bust up in the door. And I sit in the very back behind the last row of pews. And the pastor looked at me. And there was this look like I had never seen before. It was this look of love and compassion and fatherly affection that I never got from my dad fully. I knew he loved me. You know, my dad would even kiss me and uh, we before he died. And But I sensed the sincerity that he really wanted to help me. And he talked to me a little bit after the service and told me they had a youth group and and all that. So I started going there pretty regularly. And then I'd go out with the men in the church and we'd go into the neighborhoods. And back in the day, they still do it today, but not quite as much. Uh, we did the Joe the Witness thing where you knock on the door and share your faith with people. Yeah. But so I was with the men of the church. We, we were doing that activity, going out, inviting people to church, talking to people about faith, door to door. I don't know. Do they do that much in Utah now? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I bet you the Mormons, though. The Mormons, now, are, yeah. Yeah, Mormons uh, have missionaries. At 19, they send the missionaries out. Right. Uh, yeah, and uh, men and women could be missionaries. So, yeah. See them all the time. Every once in a while, they'll come over. But yeah, I was yeah. one of the, the Baptist guys that would knock on your door and ask you if you knew Jesus. So, mm. but anyways, through that process, I realized that I didn't, I didn't believe. And I was like, guys, I, I told a friend of mine online. His name's Jamie. I don't know where he's at now. We lost touch. I met him on Pal Talk as well. Mm-hmm. Same place I met my wife. I met a lot of good people on Pal Talk. It was spaces before spaces was ever thought of. Yeah. So I, I told him, like, I don't know if I'm if I was to die today. I, I'm not sure if I go to heaven, man. He's like, well, we'll get that straight today, right now. I was like, yeah, okay, okay, okay. And you know, and that's when I was back. I closed my eyes by my computer. I just close my eyes and say, Lord Jesus, you know how bad I've been. I believe that you created the heaven and the earth. I believe Jesus is your son. I believe he died for me and rose again on the third day, and I put my faith and trust in him. And that was the moment that my faith became my own. Because a lot of times, you know, you just take the faith of your family, right? Yeah. And I say there's a process where a family member takes the faith of their family. And through time, they either embrace it or they reject it, and their faith becomes their own at that point. So that that's kind of what led me to that. Hmm. When... When it comes to uh, facing death, how how do you work on your mindset there? Because it's something that everybody dies, but most people, and it, it doesn't work out for everyone. Obviously, some people die right. earlier than they expect, but uh, most people have this ex- expectation that they're going to, you know, live into to older age, you know, right, meaning right, right. at least seventies, eighties. Um, but the likelihood of that happening for you is pretty small, and uh, you didn't even know if you'd make it to the age you're currently at. How do you? How do you face that? And how do you coach people who are 
struggling with the same disease? How do you coach them on facing that? Well, Artie, it's it's difficult, as you can can imagine. Um, I grew up with death all around me, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean. Um, I had this disease that I did not understand it was fatal until later on. I'll tell you guys about that in a minute. <laughs> but I saw death uh, close and personal when my dad died. That was my first experience with death. And seeing your dad, who was once alive, there with makeup on and all the stuff they do to your body to make you look alive when you're dead, you're not alive, you're dead. No. But they try to make it look look okay for the family. It's a little easier on the family to see you that way. But I was wanting to touch my dad and they're like, no, you can't do that. I'm like, okay. So my first encounter with death was not it wasn't good. I was not a believer in Jesus at this time. And my mindset is life is life. You live, you die, you go on the ground, and that's it. Hmm. And no one took the time when my dad died to explain to me that there's a better way to view death than just the end, and that's it. You go down to the ground and you know, get recycled back into the circle of life or whatever you want to say. Uh, so that was that was hard to experience death. And then my brother died in the same room I was in, already. Hmm. And he was 20 with muscular dystrophy as well. And he had been in and out of a hospital with heart problems related to DMD. And he slept with a CPAP machine mask on his face. And it was a Saturday morning. He got up to watch cartoons. My brother was, my brother is very similar to you, Artie, that very curious mind. Hmm. Very, you know, wanting to know, uh, very curious mind. And they also like cartoons. And he liked comic books. And he had a really big collection of comic books. He's a really, really cool guy. Really compassionate man. I mean, just sweetest guy. You guys think I'm nice on X. My brother was like 20 times what I am. So he is like, to me, he was like Jesus. And I'm not, I'm not being, I'm not trying to be sacrilegious or anything. He was, he was really, it was special, and uh, he woke up, was watching cartoons, and I hated cartoons at that age because I was too cool for that, you know. I thought I was the cool guy, but I was secretly watching, you know, yeah. watching a little bit. Yeah. But uh, we had two hospital beds. He was in one hospital bed, I was in the other. And I couldn't see his bed, so I didn't know what was going on over there. And he was saying that he couldn't breathe. And I was, encouraged, you're okay. You, you're going to be okay. It's, it's okay, Daniel. You're going to be. By the way, his name was Daniel. And my son's name is Daniel. Hmm. And I thought he'd be okay. And I was in choir, and they taught you in choir, don't, don't, don't scream or you'll ruin your voice. So we're out there being selfish. My brother said, I can't breathe. Call mom. And I'm like, you're going to be okay. And I didn't want to ruin my singing voice. I mean, hmm. but I thought he'd be okay and he got quiet. So I thought he went to sleep, you know, because he'd do that. He'd watch TV and fall asleep, wake up, watch TV some more. And then my sister came in and she, she saw that he was gone. And they lifted him up off the bed and laid him down the floor. And I'm in my hospital bed and I looked down 
into my brother's eyes and he's lifeless already, just mm-hmm. nothing there. And he had let out his his you know urine and his everything, which is what happens when you die. You kind of just let all that out. Yeah. So I knew he was probably gone. And my grandfather came. He didn't know how to do CPR. He's pushing on his chest in, in a way that's not the right way. And just really trying to bring him back to life. And my sister was giving him, you know, breath for CPR. And seeing that was very traumatic. And I'm getting to the death part. And so he died. I went to his funeral. And it was rough. It was it was tough. And after my brother died, the minister of the church that I went down for when I was 16 came to talk to me and told me a bunch of stuff that I was just like, yeah, okay. Please at another place, okay. Uh, I didn't understand. And I was scared to death from that moment on, obviously, because I saw it right there in my face, my brother's lifeless face. And seeing that it does something to you already, it just. So I dealt with anxiety for a very, very long time. Debilitating anxiety where I called the ambulance to come check me out and I'd be fine. Another week later, I called the ambulance again. I was always calling the ambulance to check on me. So I was scared to death. I did not want to die. I, I had stuff I wanted to do. And. It terrified me to think about death. Now, what changed? Well, obviously, my faith in Jesus, and now I believe that if I die, I'm I'm going to be with Jesus. That helps me. Number two, I have a plan, a a purpose, a mission for being here. I want to inspire as many people as I can. I want to coach as many guys with this gym muscular dystrophy as I can to live. Their life to the fullest. I, I want to be on podcasts like this to tell people that whatever you're going through, there's hope. There, there, there's, there's more beyond what you're suffering through today. And it was my faith that helped me do that. My community, like I said, my community of friends and churches that I'm connected with and people on X and just to have a great body of people that support me and they keep me um, on the ground, so to speak. They keep me, uh, trying to think of the word, they keep me centered, they keep mm-hmm. me grounded. And the mission of helping people keeps me going. So I do a lot of mindfulness, like we talked about the other day. Yeah. And living in the moment. Like last night, my wife and I went to a Motown concert outdoors. It was it was great. It was fun. And for two hours, I was just jamming out in the park, not thinking about death. And for me, that's the best way to confront death. By laughing in its face by enjoying your life today. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to laugh when he comes and gets me. I know we personify death as the reaper coming to get us, but um, like the song says, don't fear the reaper. I don't really fear it too much. Uh, If I let myself already, I'll be afraid. But I don't stay there long. Yeah. When it comes to your brother dying at 20, same disease, uh, very different outcomes as far as timeline is concerned. Why is that? Is it be, do you have it where it's only where you partially produce dystrophin? Um, and yeah, it was. And yeah, the last that, part. yeah, that's it. Do you have it where you partially produce it and he didn't maybe? See, the, the neurologist that told me uh, that there's a possibility, 
he drew the same conclusion that you drew. Why are you still here and your brother died earlier? And he said, it could be to where you're producing dystrophine. And he wasn't. He did make that suggestion that maybe that is why you're still here. Um, but each case of the shen is differently. I hear of guys dying 16, 19, 22, 27. It's just all over the, all over the uh, spectrum. Yeah. And I don't know if there's a scientific reason for it, but I do know every case is different. And maybe, like you said, and like, the neurologist Dr. McMichael told me in Arlington, he told me that some people are still producing dystrophine, but not at an adequate level to uh, sustain the muscle development and mm. uh, sustainability. When it comes to, well, actually, so first I want to ask you, you were five years old when you got diagnosed. Um, I think you said you didn't know that it was fatal. And no. what does a five-year-old understand about fatality and death anyway? So like, Oof. how did that get relayed to you? How did that get relayed to you when you were five years old? And as you got a little bit older, like you were told you have this disease going on with your muscles where your right. muscles aren't going to work the same. Did anyone tell you that you're not going to live as long as other people? Or did they kind of keep you from knowing that at first? I hate the answer so honestly because it could paint my family in a bad light. Uh, my family did the best they could with the information that they had in the early 80s because I was born in 1981. So... The understanding of muscular dystrophy has greatly uh, increased, especially since the discovery of DNA that really helped uh, to unlock it. And they were able to find the gene responsible for uh, the issue with the dystrophy uh, distribution in your body. They've identified the gene, so now they know what it is, so they can can fix it. Uh, so you take my family that has no knowledge of the disease at all. They, they didn't know themselves. And I really feel like they didn't know how to talk to me about it. I mean, they may have tried, but I don't remember ever being told that you had this disease. No one ever talked about how I felt about my emotions. And that's why a lot of my coaching is based on how do you feel about your diagnosis. And some patients don't want to talk about that uh, with me. And they won't need to help them get a job. And, and, and I'll be glad to try to help you do that. But if you have not accepted the reality of your disease, you're not ready for the next step and I understand some guys aren't ready for the next step because they don't want to face their death but, but growing up you know a little bit longer my grandmother was a nurse but I'm not sure how much knowledge she had about the disease but she would say you know don't go outside when it's raining you might get pneumonia and you might die that's when death became entered into the equation of my mm -hmm. disease. Yeah. Or at least my thoughts about the disease. My grandmother told me, don't go outside when it's raining, you could get sick. And then I went to a doctor's appointment. And the doctor told me, he was telling one of his assistants, because a lot of times the doctors who are treating muscular dystrophy have like interns or trainees that they're teaching about the disease. And I came into the appointment and he looked to his assistant and said, cardiac pneumonia, pneumonia, pneumonia. Telling him basically, this is what we look for now. This is those, I'm like, guys, I'm standing right here. And you're telling me 
you assisted our people with my disease die transgender with pneumonia and heart problems. Um, mm. So nobody told me, Artie, until I saw my brother die. And then I was driving my wheelchair. This is what I did for therapy. It really helped. I would go on long drives in my wheelchair. We lived in the country, so I was able to do that. And my grandfather owned like four or five acres of land, so it's a lot of land. And I was just driving through the field between my part of the land and my grandfather's. And it hit me. And the thought hit me, you're terminal. You're going to die. And I was like, holy, whatever you want to insert here. And it, it was scary to realize that, oh, crap, this disease I'm fighting not only is it messing with my ability to walk and to to move my arms, but it's going to kill me. And that reality, it, it, it really shook me. And I struggled with anxiety until the process I explained in the last question. Until I got grounded by my faith and my community and my purpose in life that, that kept me from thinking so much about it. And are these still in the back of my mind? I know I could die today. Yeah. And this is what I do for myself. I allow myself a few minutes a day to think about it, right? And think about the future. And then I say, okay, let's get started with today. And there's a line from the musical Annie. And it says, but that's not now. That's then. Talking about what's going to happen in the future. And I always quote that line to the musical. And, you know, my wife and I talk about it a lot. And that's the line she quotes back to me. She goes, that that's not, that's not now, that's then. And I'm like, thank you, dear, for helping me. So my wife is my therapist if you really want to get down to it. And she keeps me grounded and she gets me to say, hey, that's not now, that's then, let's live today. So I allow myself to think about it because it's healthy to think about mortality. Because thinking about mortality can help you live your life. I'm reminded of Tuesdays with Maury. Until you learn how to die, you can't learn how to live. and. I watch that movie every year and I try to read the book every year because the wisdom of of Maury in that book, you know, he had ALS. So that inspires me with my disease that until I learn how to die, I'm not going to learn how to live. And I think already I've learned how to die and I'm ready to die. Which sets me up perfectly to be ready to live. And that's kind of what I do. I uh, I resonate with what you said about death. I, I think I think facing death or or facing mortality helps us live better. I, I truly believe that to be so because we're all going to die. We're all just dying in different ways. And if it weren't for death, we would sit around doing nothing for our entire lives because we'd have nothing to move us forward. We'd have no reason, no urgency to like do something right now. It's the the brevity of life is what kind of pushes us to do something here and now. It's like right. Um I mean for the podcast, for instance, when, when Bandit died, it was like, you know, just a reminder that life is fleeting and, and, and short. And it was like, I need to do this now. I need to start the podcast yes. up now and do it and stop telling myself that I'm going to do it next year or next month or whatever it's going to be. Yeah. Because there's always, yeah, there's always something that you could push to later, but you don't actually know that later is going to come. 
So you want to take action now. Not not that you can't prepare and and put yourself in the right position to do the things that you want to do. Of right. course, you can't you can't do everything right now, of course, but I think it's important to acknowledge mortality and, and oh, yeah. factor that into your plans. So it well, so Artie, I know you're supposed to ask the questions, but how do you deal with, with mortality? I'm just wondering what, what is your perspective on on that? Because you know mine is rooted in, in faith. So what what do you what do you do with that? Like when you think about it, how do you how do you approach it? I think there's a certain amount of faith that's been creeping up in my life over the last few years, but uh, so I'll read dark, dark books, dark history and stuff like that. Right. So I'm very aware of like bad things that can happen. And I've, uh, I'll, I'll do meditations and and things like that. And I'll, I think about death a lot actually. And I thought I was, I thought I was more comfortable with it. You know, like I just, I go through these thought experiments, like, you know, people in my family are going to die one day. A lot of people, I mean, people in my life have died and I'm, I'm going to lose more people. And then one day I'm going to die. And I almost like, I almost took it for granted that like people die, things die. I mean, I even with my dogs, I would, I would, try to appreciate my time with them with bandit for instance like i i i look at him and i would have these thoughts of like you're not always going to be with me yeah i want to appreciate this time right now so i try to just appreciate life while it's here but i i, I will totally admit that when bandit died i was not ready for it and i did not take it well i was a mess for several weeks after yeah I, it still affects me to this day, and uh, I feel cheated. I feel like he was taken from me way too early, and uh, yeah, it's it's very very difficult. It's it's much easier to logically think something through than right, to right. go Definitely. through it. Like you you think of something and you're like, yes, I I know, right? I, I know one day my parents will die. I know my pets will die. I know other loved ones will die. But when you actually face it, and and luckily my parents are both alive still, and I hope they're alive for a long time yet. Right. But you know they're getting older too. Like there are, you're you're faced with that as people get older. You're like, yeah, they're not, they're not the people they were twenty, thirty years ago. They they're more frail. Like, yeah, you have to face things like that. It's a lot harder when things are actually facing you than when you're just thinking about it of like, yeah, this will happen. And it's just an idea versus a reality. So I don't I don't really have a great answer for that. I don't No, that 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 is a that is a great answer. And and you'll feel differently if you're ever approached with something in your life like me to where I'm living death. You're observing death. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. But like you said, we're all dying, though. Yeah. Whether we know that we're decaying or not. Right now, Artie, you're a young man. You're you're strapping. You're 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 powerful. But inside is that that decay that we're all uh, undergoing. That by decay is a bit different, and I experience it every day. So. And it's kind of an unfair question to ask you because I've had time to deal with it. You know, I've had time to really dig into the subject for a personal reason. And you really haven't, you know, thought much about your mortality other than it motivated you to get off your butt and get busy with stuff because, you know, you're going to die. So let's get stuff done while we're here. Yeah. And to be honest with you, my understanding of death has accelerated my life. Um, I, I move fast. I don't waste time. 
Hmm. And that could be challenging to some people that want to go slow. But hey, you know, let's get married. Hey, let's let's have a kid. Hey, let's let's go to Bible college. Hey, let's let's be a youth pastor. Like, yeah. I'm always going, Arnie, and that's what death has done for me. It's motivated me to go. And I know I can't outrun death. He's there chasing me in that personification that we use of death chasing us. But it's closing in on me, but I'm a few I'm a few feet ahead and walking yeah. by faith. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad you answered that question and until you learn how to die, you can't learn how to live. So that that always sticks out to me. Yeah, and there's, I mean, I'm a big reader. I, I've I've read Tuesdays with Maury several times, and I, I think it's one of the greatest books ever. I love that book. Oh yeah, it's. Um, I read the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying a few years back, oh, cool. and that actually was really helpful. I didn't do all the meditations in the book necessarily, but you know, I contemplated a lot while I was reading that. And it and it kind of shifted the way I, I think about death a bit. I do accept death as a natural part of life, but it doesn't change the fact that when when you're attached to another being or your own life, it, it doesn't change the fact that like like I said, you can you can logically think something through, but actually dealing with right. it is a lot different, you know? You can say like, oh, yes, my dog is going to die at some point in the future right? But when it's just, it's still an abstract thought at a certain se- in a certain sense. But when it's actually right. facing you or when you wake up and you see your dog dead and you see its eyes and you see his eyes are not the same anymore, you know, right. and, and like you said, like you release all your fluids and stuff like that. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty hard. Um, there's a, there's pictures of my dog I don't like to look at anymore. Uh, oh. He used to he used to uh, I used to love taking pictures of him when he was uh, he'd fall asleep sometimes and he, his tongue would be sticking out of his mouth and it would look really cute and funny and I would take yeah. pictures of it. There's a couple pictures I have of that. And I don't like it because it actually reminds me of yeah. what I saw after he died. So yeah, death is, it's not an easy thing to face, no. but it is something that we should all consider sometimes yeah. because you're not going to be here forever. If you want to do something, there's no time like now to do it. And yes. and you should, baby, you should yeah. have that motivation. That, that was one of the phrases, you know, in literature class in, I think, 10th grade. We did Shakespeare and the whole Carpe Diem thing. And that 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 really, like, resonates with me. Carpe Diem, seize today. Today is a day that you're alive right now. Yeah. Seize that day, you know, squeeze it for all it's worth, like you're squeezing orange juice out of an orange. And that's what I do, Arnie. I try to squeeze as much life out of out of every day as I can. And some days I waste my days, but most days I'm like, like tonight there's going to be a, a another classical concert outdoors tonight, hmm. and I'm going to get on the train and I'm going to go up there to it and I'm going to listen because I love music and you know. So that's what I do, Arnie. I find something fun to do every day. Uh, I help my clients and uh, I talk to people like you every single day on X and I'm building the community with, with Fabio and Jason and the creators lab gave me a, a, a purpose and uh, working with Jason and Fabio, it, they're like my boys, man. They're like, everybody needs to ride or die people. And that's another way I get through my disease. Is yeah. you know maybe there's people struggling today. Find your ride or die people and allow them to support you, and and be open to share your struggle with them. Yeah, because those two guys know a lot about what I'm going through that I don't share publicly, and they told me anything you need, we got you. 
And that, that's really amazing. And I know all of you expressed the same, the same to me and everybody in our group. You know, everybody loves me and I feel it. And I really appreciate the love and support that I get from X. It's amazing. Yeah, I, I just want to say, I don't think you painted your family in a bad light at all. I don't think, you know, if you have a five-year-old that got di- get, gets diagnosed with a fatal disease, I don't think there is a right way to approach that, you know? Like, no. there, there just is no right way. Like, do you tell a five-year-old that they're going to die before all their, most of their friends? Do you, do you tell a five-year-old everything's going to be okay and lie? Like, Certain instances where a little bit of lying, I think, is justified, and and that's one of them that I can, I I think it can go either way. I some people might consider it cruel to tell a five year old the truth in, in that case, yeah. and I don't think they're wrong. I I just don't think there's a right answer for that. Yeah, th- there's no wrong or right way, and what I said earlier could also be misunderstood that. You know, parents should be very careful about the clinical trials. But in the end, it's your child. You know, you you get to decide what's the best medical option for your child. I just hope that everybody makes, you know, logical decisions and does what's best for them. And in the groups I'm in, these questions do get asked. You know, when should I tell my when should I tell my son that he's fatal and these are real, real questions, but thankfully there are psychologists that have written papers and stuff for, for families to read about mm. talking to their kids about uh, the disease. So like I said, today, mental health is like very serious, right? Yeah. And it's not a joke. And psychologists are really helping people with the shin muscular dystrophy to understand the disease and to share their emotions. And I I really appreciate the emphasis on mental and emotional health that I'm seeing in the community. It's not just the disease, it's the mental and emotional impact of the disease that we need to talk about too, you know? Yeah. Um, when it comes to your own child, your son, um, how did that conversation progress over his lifetime? Um, you know, his, his, his father is likely not to live as long as some of his friend's fathers and uh, as long as his mother should live. And, you know, uh, when you're a kid, right. your, your parents are kind of invincible. Like you... Uh, people take it for granted that their parents are always going to be there. And, and that's why it's so tragic when a child loses his parent yes. or his or her parent at an, a young age, because like you, you just end up lost. But how does, how did that conversation like first start getting, you know, like your son starts seeing you, uh, where you were already in a wheelchair when you had your son, right? Yes, that's right. So he's at least, I mean, he's used to that. But right. the mortality aspect of it, you know, like how how did that conversation progress over his life? My wife and I really talk a lot about about it. And disclaimer, I'm not saying every family should should be this way. But we have a no lying policy and in this family, which is why certain traditions don't get celebrated. Uh, And I'm not going to dig into that because we believe certain things are based on lies and you shouldn't lie to your children. Hmm. That's our belief, not anybody else's. And I'm not saying that. So we've always been up front with our son about the realities of life. Uh, And Every child, this is my belief, can accept adult themes as long as it is on their level. 
So death is a very adult theme. And I think that a child can understand it as long as you bring it down to their level. So I don't remember if we ever had a direct talk about it. But we've always talked about, you know, dad's got a disease that is going to get worse. And he is probably going to die before mommy. And uh, and he knew that. And it became real during the pandemic when he had to protect himself to protect me. And that's when it got really emotionally hard for him because, you know, everybody was locked down. We were, we were even cleaning our groceries before he brought it in. He had to go to school. He, He went to school his whole year wearing a mask. Every day he wore a mask and I asked him to do sanitizer today. It's just, he had that burden and it was a burden to, to make sure I don't bring this terrible uh, virus home to, and my dad would be affected. So he always grew up knowing that dad's different. Dad's going to die a little earlier. And I think that that has always taught him to appreciate dad and time with dad. And that our family, That that's why we don't do materialism. I would rather spend $100 doing an event with my son than to have $100 something on my wall. You you know what I mean? And my son's a little bit different. His love language is gifts, so he likes to give stuff. Uh, Just the other day, for Father's Day, yesterday, I wish I could show you. Um, But he got me from Builder there. A cookie monster. It's a big cookie monster from Villa Bear. And he knows that that's my nickname because of my voice and all that. And I just smile. I sit over here on my desk and I just smile and I look at it. Um, but he's a very loving kid. And he grew up knowing that at any moment, life can change uh, for the bad. Yeah. And then he saw it firsthand when his papa died. Uh, He had testicular cancer, and he died during the pandemic. So my son was not able to go to the funeral or any of that stuff. My wife didn't get to go either. But when his papa died, that, that affected him. And then my first grandma and my grandfather was married to for 50 something years. Died when he remarried, and his new wife had cancer and she died. And her name was D, so the D was actually the first time he experienced death with her, but he wasn't real close to her. And then his papa died, my wife's dad, and that really affected my son. And I think it your understanding that death evolves through experience. I think he knows a little bit more, so much so that he said when he becomes a doctor, he wants to research muscular dystrophy and try to find treatments and a cure. So that, that's his level of awareness about the disease has evolved. And from that little child understanding to this, Adult understanding that dad's got this disease. I don't know how long he's going to be here, but I'm going to try to do something about it. I'm going to go get educated and become a doctor. And and it's just incredible to hear him talk like that, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. What are, what are you hoping to do with however long you have left on the earth? What are some of the things that you want to, want to do and accomplish? Ooh. I have a grand vision of creating a course to train young men with descent muscular dystrophy to be coaches. And I would love to 
train a whole group of young men with my disease and send them out uh, as coaches, it would do several things. Number one, it would give them a purpose learning to become a coach to other people with their disease. Number two, it would give them a financial means, a way to make a little bit of money. And number three, it would help the muscular dystrophy community in general to have all these young men helping each other, you know, deal with the disease, the emotions, and also finding what people want to do with their life. And that's a lot of what life coaching is. I I come alongside them and say, what do you want out of your life? And I try to help them set goals to to make it to that point. So I'd really love to see something like that happening. Um, I'd love to be in a financial state where I could travel more. I really want to travel. There's things I want to see, like the Grand Canyon. And yeah, I would like to come up there to Utah. I know it's a Mormon town, but I, I, I think that the the infrastructure that's built there, even though it's like Mormon architecture, it's still beautiful uh, uh, architecture. You know, you live there, so you've probably seen it. So I want to see beautiful things like that. So yeah. uh, so apart from training uh, guys to, to do what I do, I also want to, I want to see the world. I want to see what's out there. and. Uh, travel a little more and uh, I'd like to see my son graduate college and it would be nice to be married for 50 years that'd be nice uh, yeah those are some things I'm I'm looking forward to yeah well if you ever make it to Utah I definitely want to see you um yes, it's a beautiful be, state be fun. it's a beautiful state I it really is um I'm not way into architecture but there's a lot of natural beauty here. There's, you know, a lot of national parks, a lot of beautiful land here. So I definitely want to go to the Redwood Forest in California, dude. Uh, I am so, I'm so all that. I have a friend that's that's wanting to do some traveling later, and uh, I'm like, can I go with you? It would be so much fun to just go see, because you know the sequoia trees are supposedly the oldest tree in America, from what I understand. Yeah. And they're like really, really tall. So I, I want to go see something that yeah. that like breathtaking is why I want to go see the Grand Canyon too. I want to see breathtaking. I want something that's going to just punch me in the face and be like, what? Yeah. What? So that's what I like. Yeah, Redwood National Park. It, like th- those trees are massive. I've I've went there once, and they're massive. It's insane. Yes, it, I, I love it. I love it. Yeah, it's it's like you look up and you're like, just how big they are. It's so unimaginable. And how small we are. Like yeah, yeah. It's like incredible. Yeah. So well, I have. I hope you get to do all those things. I really do. And, and if I don't, there's always the uh, coaching exercise where you mentally go there in your mind. And, uh, you know, you can do that, too. And your mind actually thinks you really went there. But yeah. And uh, I do that a lot. I like I'll look at like walkthroughs of, of like the Statue of Liberty and like these great wonders of the world. I watch like videos that people have taken in like 4K where they actually go up in the Statue of Liberty and show you all around. Yeah. So I've actually been to places like digitally that I may never ever see. And, and for that, I'm thankful for technology uh, that I can do that. So, But as far as like New York City, no, nah, I don't want to do that. I'd love to go here and watch the Broadway play, play. But I'm not really into the urban thing. I want to go out yeah. to the you know, John Denver type places, you know, country road, take me home. And I want to see some of the great wonders in Arizona and Utah and, you know, California, 
you know, Washington State. That'd be cool. Yeah. Are there uh, are there books that you recommend? Books that have really influenced you. I know you you mentioned Tuesdays with Maury. Obviously, that one. Are there other books that have really touched you in your life that you recommend to people? Uh, well, this is going to be a uh, uh, duh answer, I know, but the Bible. I think there's a lot of uh, insight and hope and inspiration and faith in the Bible that has inspired me. But I'm trying to think. Um, recently, I read a book called uh, Permission to Screw Up. Hmm. And Permission to Screw Up is a really good book. I can't think of the author right now. But she is the CEO of a cleaning company that takes college kids. And her her business is built on college kids doing the cleaning work to, like, uh, move out to apartment complexes and things like that, condos. And she outlines in her book many of the times that she has failed and that it was okay because through her failure, it taught her lessons to be a better CEO. Um, Kristen, uh, Kristen Hadid, is that right? Yeah, sounds about right. She also did a TED Talk on it as well. But yeah, that was a very good book. Um, I, I know Pastor Joe Olstein, I know a lot of people don't like him for different reasons. And uh, that's a different topic for another day, but he has written some good books that that I like. I don't like all of his theology because he's a little bit different than me. I'm I'm more of a conservative Baptist uh, when it comes to theology. He's more, you know, self help type guy. But some of his books are really good that that have inspired me. Uh, because he incorporates faith into the self, the self help kind of uh, sphere of things. So I like what he says, but there are some criticisms about him. But you know that's not between him and me. I like some of the stuff he writes. Uh, good stuff that way. I just like inspiring stuff. Yeah. Like. Joshua, it's been amazing talking to you and it's it's been awesome becoming your friend and getting to spend so much time with you on X and stuff like that. I mean, spaces must be great for you because I'd imagine writing and having a written conversation is, uh, even though it's getting difficult to speak, it's it's yeah. much harder to have a written conversation for you. So yes, very uh, much. spaces are pretty awesome for that. So it's been, and that's how we really got to know each other is from spaces. So yeah. I really appreciated your friendship. Yeah, I, I just, you know, I, I consider myself a friend of the show, and I definitely, I, I love what you're doing, and uh, I I listen to you on my Amazon device. I told you this, I'll be waiting in bed to, to play your, my, your podcast, and no, I don't go to sleep listening to it. I wait till you're done, and then I go to sleep. But, yeah, you, you had some really unique, unique guests, and uh Thank you for letting me be among some of your unique guests. And I hope I hope that it's been a good podcast for people to hear. And I hope they are inspired to, to overcome their challenges and just keep pressing forward. That's all we can do. Keep pressing forward. Keep making a difference. Yeah. Find a purpose. Stay grounded, you know, and, and move forward. Before we wrap up, I want to give you a chance to share. Uh, you mentioned there's a, a a charity that people can donate to if they want to help with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy research. And then anything else you want to share, like where can people find you on X and or any other social media you're on and uh, if they want to work with you as a coach, things like that. And then anything else you feel like sharing. All right. Well, I, I hang out in a lot of places. You can find me on X. I am the only at Joshua Busby, B-U-S-B-Y. There are some other Joshua Busby's out there, but I'm the only one that got the name first. <laughs> so you can find me on X, just at Joshua Busby, and you'll find me. 
Uh, that way, I'm always on X hanging around doing things, so you, you'll find me easily. Um, I'm also on on uh, Facebook, Joshua Busby. Uh, it's harder to find people on Facebook, but, but just look around, you'll find me. And uh, I hang out in a lot of the muscular dystrophy groups and uh, trying to help help there. Or you can also find me at um, Beyond Boundaries Life Coaching at a Facebook page that you can get in touch with me that way and if, if you want some coaching. You don't have to be a guy with muscular dystrophy to, to get coaching from me. Uh, I do free discovery calls and they can get in touch with me uh, on X and I'll be glad to sit down with them and Tell them what I do and how I can help them. And and if we can get together and, and help one another, that would be great to do that. But there is a, an organization that helps uh, kids with muscular dystrophy, and it's called the JET Foundation, J-E-T-T Foundation. And what they do is they, also, they have a program to where they help people get handicapped bands. And they have a program to where they'll pay 50% of the funds. You raise 50% and they'll match the 50% and help you get a van. They also have camps that they put on and for the guys with the shin. And one of the struggles for guys with the shin is they don't get together. They have problems with socializing. So to help guys with the shit socialize, this would be a great organization to go to because they have these camps that they pay for. And the kids don't have to pay anything. They can come and be a kid. They had nurses and doctors and CNAs all on site. So you get to go swimming. You get to go do all the things you do at summer camp. And then they do uh, get money for research and stuff like that. So. It's a great organization. I, I trust them physically. Uh, they they handle their money and their finances right. So I I wholeheartedly support what they're doing. Definitely. Oh yeah, one last thing. You can find me on YouTube as well. So my family and I used to do a, a family vlog. We still do it, but not as much. So buzzing around with the Buzzbees, you can find me on YouTube that way. And there's some cool adventures we went on. And uh, so, yeah, that's how you can find me, guys. Awesome. Josh, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for the great conversation. It was really enjoyable for me. It was a pleasure to talk to you today. Well, thank you for having me, man. And uh, keep on keeping on. You're doing great. And I'm I'm very proud of what you're doing, and thank you for having me on. And I uh, hope you can find some, some more great guests. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If our conversations resonate with you, consider leaving a five-star review on Apple and Spotify. It goes a long way in helping the show grow and reach more listeners. If you'd like to support the show, you can go to thoughtfullymindless.com under the support tab, where you can find my Amazon affiliate store where I have brands that I personally use, and fractalzoo.net, which is where I have unique fractal-inspired t-shirts that I design. You can find me on social media on x at rdtmpodcast and Instagram at thoughtfullymindless. Thank you for taking the time to listen today. Until next time. Stay thoughtfully mindless.